Okay, it looks like a, a few members of our audience have joined, so we'll now officially make a start to this event. So good evening, everyone. I'm Nick Vasiliev. I'm host of Booktopia's podcast, Tell Me What to Read. I'd first of all like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners on the lands on which we meet, and I pay my respects to all elders past and present, and, and I extend this to any First Nations people watching this evening. And I am thrilled, as you can see below, to be joined by the author of many mega bestsellers, Jasper Jones, Honey Bee, and of course, more recently, Runt, which we'll be talking about this evening, the one and only Craig Sylvie. Craig, welcome. Nick, thanks so much for having me. I'm looking forward to it. It's an absolute pleasure to have you. And for all of our listeners and people watching this evening, before we kick off, we would absolutely love to hear from you. So comment any questions that you would like us uh, me, me to ask uh, Craig this evening via our little Q&A icon, which you can find probably in the bottom right or left-hand corner there with a question mark. And we'll do our best to try and get to as many as we can before the end of the event. And if you haven't, if you've already ordered a copy of Runt, let us know uh, in the comments as well uh, and tell us what you think. Um, and let's first of all dive straight into this amazing book uh, that you've put together. You, you know, you're an established writer um, and, you know, with two huge, big, best-selling books um, under your belt. Out of curiosity, was being an author always something that you wanted to do going forward or did you just kind of fall into it? Well, it's, it's always been a natural inclination uh, that I've had uh, since I was younger. You know, I was an obsessive and voracious reader as a kid. And when it first occurred to me that I could tell my own lies and make up my own stories and, and give them to other people to read, um, it was a really infectious thrill. Um, and that has never really ebbed for me. So regardless of whether or not it was my job, um, I would do it anyway. It's how I process uh, uh, things internally, how I make sense of the world. Um, you know, it, it, but it was always my aspiration to connect with people and reach people and, and tell stories uh, that, that mattered. Um, and so uh, since I was very, very young, uh, it was always my, my ambition. Yeah, and, and often you, you, I imagine that being in that author mindset and getting the hang of it, you probably look at the world in so many new and exciting ways because you're always looking for characters and always looking for new ways to kind of view and, and see things. I oh, will get to to run in a second. Is that kind of the way? Well, I know kind of feeling writing run, you know, after the success of, you know, Jasper Jones, people have kind of, you know, when you have a book or books like that that become very successful, I imagine people expect you to come out with books that are similar. Was there kind of pressure when you uh, were sitting down to, to write runt and kind of live up to books that you'd done previously? Or did you just go, no, nah, we're going straight in and just doing it? That, that pressure uh, tends to occur to me uh, on the eve of publication. Um, that's when you're <laughs> more or less aware of uh, the prospect of potentially disappointing hundreds of thousands of people. Um, you know, that's, that's when you feel the most anxious and the most vulnerable uh, because it's beyond your control at that point. Once a story becomes one of these, um, it's for other people to uh, read and appreciate and delve into and to ultimately define. And uh, that can be nerve wracking for, for any writer. Um, but in the process of uh, developing a manuscript, um, it's really quite beautiful. You're alone with it. You let the story come to you and emerge of its own accord and you strike up uh, very private relationships with the characters and um, uh, and, and the stories that, that uh, they're unfolding to you. And so you tend to want to displace uh, all those externalities, all those realities of, of uh, publishing and reception and criticism and um, uh, all those other elements of, of the job and you get back to where you, you try to uh, protect uh, everything that feels pure about writing when it's just you and your story. So in and of the moment, it doesn't tend to occur to me. It's only right now when you ask me questions like that. <laughs> yeah. It's. I, I know it's. Someone kind of described it once as like a, a writing a book is like almost being in a relationship. I love that you kind of describe it as like you you strike up some sort of camaraderie with this thing that you're putting together. You have no idea where it's going or how it's going to turn out, but that it, it'll you go through almost an emotional cycle 
with this with the book with you know this book that you're creating because you also have to do things like say goodbye to it which is absolutely yeah. terrifying and like be prepared for the moment where oh i have to sign off on this i can't make any more changes i'm done after yeah. this particular point which is can often be so nerve-wracking um what how did what's just, what's a good coping mechanism what's something after that moment where you're like okay i need to find a way to actually let go and emotionally uh disconnect myself from this book that i've been so invested in well something that certainly helps is the opportunity to tour a book and to share it with readers and to have the opportunity to connect with people hear their responses um discover what it means to people um what their relationship has been like with with the book and its characters and and how it's shaped and challenged and um and helped to define them it's a really beautiful part of the process and um you come to learn ultimately that the writer that you uh its creator doesn't necessarily really matter what really matters is that very sanctified connection between a book um and its constellation of letters and the reader who decodes them and uh, creates a story internally uh, on their own terms using the um, authority of their imagination and their soul and their history. Um, that's, that's the really beautiful thing about, about books. Um, so I'm, I'm an adjunct to that. Uh, I'm, I'm not necessarily part of that process. And so it's a, it's a really beautiful thing to bear witness to. Um, and it's so lovely to, to tour a book and uh, hear people's impressions and, and interpretations as well. Absolutely. You, you absolutely nail it on the head, just to kind of that, uh, that connection to it. And it enables you to, to create amazing books like this. Let's, uh, let's talk about runs. Let's, uh, give, us your bar, give us your pitch for anyone who is not familiar uh, with this book. Right, well, Runt tells the story of 11-year-old Annie Shearer who uh, lives in the town of Ups and Downs on her parents' sheep farm. Uh, Annie has a proclivity for fixing things. Uh, in fact, she wears an old leather tool belt with her everywhere she goes. She's also uh, quite a solitary character. She's very comfortable in her own company. But her best and only friend is a stray dog who she rescued whose name is Runt. And the two of them share a very remarkably close bond. Uh, Runt will only listen to Annie um, and he obeys her every whim and command. Every time she waves her magic finger, he'll follow her. Um, and on account of his years living on the main streets of ups and downs, evading capture, Runt is a remarkably spry and agile and athletic dog, uh, which makes uh, the two of them quite a formidable team when it comes to herding up the shearers' sheep, which routinely break out in search of greener <laughs> pastures. Um, and so when Annie learns that her home is under threat uh, by one of the local power brokers, it becomes the biggest problem that she wants to fix. However, it's a little bit too large for her tool belt to accommodate. Um, and so she searches for a solution. Uh, she stumbles across one at a country fair, the Woolorama Show, uh, when she uh, uh, discovers a canine agility course. And she sees these dogs jumping over hurdles, leaping through hoops, running through tunnels and weaving through slaloms. And she recognises that she and Runt might have a competitive advantage. And so she enters. And when she does so, she comes to learn that uh, were they to do well enough, they might qualify for the very prestigious Crumpets Dog Show in London, which offers a cash prize for its grand championship, which would more than capably uh, solve the Shearer family uh, financial woes. So that becomes her chief aspiration. However, there are a couple of bigger hurdles uh, standing in her way. The first and most pressing of which is the fact that Runt will not move uh, he will not obey Annie if anyone else is watching. Um, it just has to be the two of them. It's their own secret little world. Uh, so Annie has to find a way around that. The other issue is uh, uh, Runt's chief villain. His name is Fergus Fink. Uh, he's well known in the canine agility course circles. Um, uh, he's quite a nefarious, bombastic, arrogant character. He comes from a long line of Finks. Each of his antecedents have won both the national titles 
and the Crumpets Dog Show. Uh, everyone except Fergus. He's finished runner-up 15 years in a row, and it's made him quite a desperate <laughs> And so when he sees Runt and Annie, these two vibrant interlopers from the town of Ups and Downs, he will stop at nothing uh, from preventing them from taking the grand prize. Oh, God, yes. That, you couldn't have nailed it any better. That is, <laughs> a, I love it. It's such a, so many exciting things going on. It's absolutely fantastic. And yeah, nailed it. Could, couldn't have pitched it any better. Um, <laughs> Where is the? Where, I want to know uh, what the inspiration for this book was because it's it's a very sharp term from previous books that you've done. What was what was the inspiration for Runt? It's it's hard to sort of define what the genesis of a story is. They often start uh, with a very small idea that feels laden with potential, and so this one was really uh, a little girl uh, who was solitary and displaced in her town. Uh, who shared a very close bond with her dog, uh, who happened to be a rescued stray. Um, and I knew that the two of them had a very close bond. And I also knew that uh, this dog had remarkable abilities, which were only revealed to her. It was their own little bubble, their own little universe. And that felt um, interesting enough for me. You know, you get an instinct, I suppose, for a story. You get this sort of notion that there's something um, profound and, and special there and that you just need to uh, kind of spend time with it and chase it and try to discover it. Um, you know, a good writer leaves themselves open to, to all narrative possibilities and, and, and all types of stories. Um, and, you know, you do get an intuition for it, I suppose, the same way that, I don't know, pigs can smell particular truffles or something, you know, that, that you get a sense for a story that other people might not necessarily um, recognise. And so I knew there was something about this story that, that felt like bottled lightning, you know, that felt really special. Um, and so I started spending a lot of time with it um, and letting it come to me and letting it unravel. Uh, and I'm so glad that I did. I really love working on this story. Um, it was uh, a really joyful uplifting, hopeful book to write. I think I needed it. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, um, you know, it, there's a lot of darkness in the world right now. And Runt is a big ray of sunshine. And uh, it, was, it was an absolute joy to, to work on. And I'm really proud of it. You absolutely should be. And you are absolutely right about it, kind of that that ray of colour. There's something, the, the word I kind of felt about it because there's a lot of stories about that are out there in the world uh, that around uh, uh, the relationship between, you know, a child and their, their animal or their dog or their cat or whatever it may be. There was something timeless about this. It, it felt like, you know, the anything, it could have taken place at any time, which it, and it was it was wonderful. What appealed to you about actually... Uh, writing this relationship between these, th this dog and this kid on the page. Yeah, I'm, I'm so pleased to hear you say that. You know, Runt, I think, is a bit of a, of a love letter to the books that shaped me when I was a younger reader. Um, mm. You know, a book like Charlotte's Web, for example, uh, is still very mm. dear to me, and it's a book that I, that I really treasure. Um, Roald Dahl's work, you know, Danny Champion of the World and, and Matilda and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, um, a lot of Paul Jennings' work. Um, you know, there's a whimsy and an oddity and an eccentricity and um, um, a real uh, particular tone to, to their narrative voice that I, um, that I suppose I wanted to tribute in, in writing Runt. And so... Um, I think that might be what gives it that timeless quality. It's a very contemporaneous story. You know, Annie Shearer has a brother called Max whose chief aspiration is to be a YouTube star. And, you know, his amateur <laughs> brother, uh, you know, uh, her grandmother, Dolly, uh, is looking for love in all the wrong places. She's on an app called Widower. Um, you know, so there are very modern components to this story, but I think its narrative voice uh, gives, it a, gives it a really timeless feel and um it was heavily influenced by writers like eb white and, and Roald dahl and douglas adams and 
um, uh, in a blood to a certain extent, you know. Um, I, I do typically write about uh, close relationships. Jasper Jones and Charlie uh, in Honeybee, uh, there's Sam and Vic. And in Runt, mm. uh, there is Annie and, and Runt, you know. Um, mm. And the bond that they share, the hope that Annie uh, has and uh, her determination, they're the beating heart of, of this story. Um, and uh, it catalyzes a big change in the characters around her. Uh, the town of ups and downs is in a state of some decline and decay. Um, Annie's family are nursing a lot of worries and anxieties and concerns. And just by being herself, Annie inspires uh, hope and kindness and generosity in the people around her. And, um, you know, she, uh, she creates a lot of change in, in the people around her. And it's, um, it's her belief in runt um, and her stubborn will, um, which creates that change. And I, I found that a, a really seductive thing to an alluring uh, theme to, to write about. Absolutely. And I love that you kind of there's a touch on that there was a couple of things of similarities between, you know, Runt and your earlier work, particularly this this two relationship dynamic that is always at the core of so many of your books. Um, I always kind of wanted to like just ask, trace that back for me that you always you always build these books around that core relationship. I'm, I'm kind of curious to unpack how you do that. Is that just something that you, you find that core relationship, which is just the foundation that how everything comes together and then you just build it out from around that? Is that kind of how it, it starts for you? Yeah, and look, I mean, I, I don't pretend for a moment to know what I'm doing. Uh, I'm thoroughly <laughs> unqualified <laughs> uh, to, to write novels. Um, but it seems to me subconsciously, I suppose, that um, I look for a moment in a character's life um, where uh, there's a, a restlessness and uh, an opportunity uh, to change. And often uh, in our lives, that comes with the intervention or the introduction of uh, a vibrant new character. It certainly is the case for, for Charlie and Jasper Jones. It's absolutely the case in Honeybee um, with Sam and Vic. Even in my first novel, Rhubarb, um, these two very uh, displaced, isolated people uh, miraculously find each other and it changes them and it's no different in runt um, you know I think uh, if, if if there's any uh, I suppose shift in that theme it's uh, you know runt I think is um, it's magic comes from uh, the change that Annie inspires in the people around her you know um, Annie's relationship with runt such as it is, is, um, uh, you know, really tight and there's not a lot of conflict that underpins it. Um, they, they certainly um, help each other. There's no question about that. But I think, uh, you know, if Runt has any thematic terrain, uh, it's, um, it's the permission that Annie gives the people around her to be themselves and uh, to celebrate those points of difference. I love that. I love that that's kind of feels like just a button on her character. And it's hard to always summarize characters to the page, but it's something that just screams out at her. And it, and it leans onto a, a kind of another point that I thought was an interesting challenge for you, just kind of from looking at this book and seeing what you had to come across, which is also writing something for a younger audience. Um, you know, you've done lots of contemporary fiction novels, um, but you know, obviously, like it's it's a whole other kettle of fish to to write for a younger audience and make sure you you str uh, straddle that line of you know treating that audience with respect, but also keeping in mind of, of the fact that they are a younger audience. Um, did it kind of just come naturally with the nature of the story? Because you you weren't thinking about the audience as like you always always in that writer's mindset, or did you kind of set out in mind with going let's I want to kind of have, you know have that privilege of writing for for a younger audience. Yeah, as I say, you um, you begin uh, uh, a narrative journey with something that feels very small, um, but weighty, heavy, uh, concentrated, and you nibble around the edges of it, and you tease it, and you prod it, and you poke it, and you uh, extract little threads and 
Um, you spend time with it uh, enough to have these sparks, these kind of discoveries and revelations. And it's up to you. Part of the artistry of writing a novel is decoding that and learning uh, who the story wants to centre, um, how it wants to be structured, um, what voice is going to carry it, whether it's going to be um, uh, told through a very particular lens, through one character's eyes, or it's more omniscient, uh, you know, a broader voice, which is going to maybe coordinate uh, uh, more characters. And one of those decisions is, uh, is going to be who it's for and who might ultimately identify it with the story the most. And so it became abundantly clear to me very quickly that um, this was a book that was probably readily accessible to younger readers. Um, you know, the fact that Annie was uh, our story's hero, um, the fact that despite there being some um, uh, more than enough material for uh, more sophisticated uh, adult readers to uh, to chew on. You know, I really feel like this is a book for everybody. Um, that it was uh, it was going to be a, a story that um, younger readers would uh, appreciate. And so, in knowing that, you start to sculpt the story around that kind of language. And I I suppose um, I was, as I mentioned, I was I was influenced foremost by those stories that meant the most to me when I was growing up and how they were structured, uh, how they were told. And I found that really kind of liberating. I really loved the permission that I had to be funny and to be whimsical and eccentric and odd, um, to give characters weird, funny names. Um, you know, I got to uh, uh, employ that Roald Dahlian uh, technique of being quite judgmental and opinionated and a bit wicked sometimes. And so there are some, you know, there are some moments in, in Runt where the narrative voice uh, gets a bit judgy and, uh, you know, it gets even a little bit cruel, you know. Um, you know, I love that opportunity and, uh, you know, it was, it was really heavily imprinted by the books that shaped me. Um, uh, and, um, with a, with a heavy dose of, I suppose, my personal background, you know, growing up in the country, um, uh, having that experience, it, it left a, a deep impression on me and it, it really flavours the, the town about ups and downs and Annie herself. Absolutely. And, I, and kind of going back to that point that you mentioned about that lighthearted voice and kind of leaning into that, I imagine this probably would have been a much more lighthearted story to write. You, you mentioned earlier that, you know, you we are living in kind of a lot much darker times and, and it's, and the world does seem, you know, around us a little colder. And, and I guess additionally in the past, I mean, in the past you've touched on really heavy topics in all, all of your books. Um, was it, I, I imagine it would have been a relief to sit down and say, you know what, I'm going to write a story like this. What did it feel like that? Yeah, look, I'm, I'm a big believer that the right stories find us at the right time. Um, and I think that's true for novelists as much as readers. Um, you know, I'd had the idea uh, for this book in my back pocket for a few years. And, uh, you know, I was always uh, uh, intending to, uh, to develop it further, but I, I didn't quite have the creative space. Um, I'd been working on other things. And then a couple of things happened. The, the first is that I finished the final edits for Honeybee and I found myself uh, emotionally exhausted, I suppose. I was a bit wrung out <laughs> and hollowed out by that book. Um, and I was looking for a, a creative project that felt like a real departure um, and that felt uh, very different. Um, and the other thing that happened was a protracted global calamity in the form of a pandemic. And so we all found ourselves suddenly, uh, you know, locked in, or in the case of West Australians, locked out, um, uh, nursing some anxieties, feeling isolated, uncertain, and uh, many of us contending with some uh, financial concerns as well. And so that seemed to be, for me, the perfect environment to reach into my bottom drawer and blow the dust off my notes and start spending my days in the very admirable company of Annie Shearer and Runt and the wonderful people of Ups and Downs. 
um, you know, as I mentioned, it, it was a really uplifting, hopeful story for me to write. Um, I really look forward to attending to the desk every day. Um, <laughs> and it was, you know, uh, the opportunity to, to be funny and to be whimsical and to spend time with these characters, it was no chore, you know, it was, it was a, a, a deep and robust pleasure. Um, and so uh, it was a really um, enjoyable process. Uh, and, you know, I, I, think, I think a lot of that joy is sort of imprinted on the page. I think so, definitely. It, it is just because there is, again, going back to that timelessness, it, it just radiates it, and it feels so warm. And another thing that I kind of want to talk about, because, you know, with a book like this, you can, is, uh, is Sarah's contributions as illustrator. Um, for everyone seeing here, I mean, there's plenty more, uh, plenty more images inside, but I love uh, the amazing work that Sarah Acton has done here as the illustrator for this book. What was it like, first of all, you know, working with, a, with an illustrator like Sarah and kind of seeing her bring the story to life through her illustrations? Oh, she's brilliant. Uh, she's an amazing talent um, and an extraordinary artist. Uh, you know, I, I, in wanting to um, tribute and herald those books that I loved when I was a kid, um, Quentin Blake's illustrations were uh, foremost in my mind. Um, you know, they elevated Roald Dahl's books indelibly. You know, they brought them to life. And I wanted uh, illustration or some art that, that, um, that achieved the same goal. Um, and I wanted that same kind of simple uh, uh, watercolory line drawing um, uh, style, but I wanted it a little bit warmer. You know, there's, there's, uh, there's something a bit sort of um, scratchy about Quentin Blake's illustrations that perfectly embodied Roald Dahl's characters. There's no question about that. Um, but Runt is a little bit warmer, you know, and, and I wanted a, a softness and a roundness um, uh, to the illustrations. And so Sarah was the perfect artist to bring this story to life. I, I'll be honest with you, I did very little other than identify which story beats or which scenes, which characters warranted illustration um, and sort of staggered those uh, moments across the, across the story um, so that they were relatively evenly dispersed. Um, I gave a very modest brief, and then from there it was um, it was all down to Sarah and her magic. Um, she's an extraordinary artist. She um, just understood what this story was about, um, and just uh, I, I love I love these illustrations so much. I wish we had more of them, to be honest. Mm. Um, <laughs> yeah. She's just gloriously talented, and we're very very fortunate to have her work underpinning the the book absolutely i can i'm bringing it up here just so everyone can see it you can definitely see the uh, i love that you've mentioned quentin blake and all of the great um great illustrations that inspired it i imagine yeah. this would have been a very unique thing to see yeah. oh yes yeah they, is that they, your favorite or just oh i think my favorite i'd have to oh here my favorite is actually um this one here uh <laughs> and so this is the moment so when Annie tries to uh, uh, find a way to uh, fix Runt to help overcome this problem that he has uh, in not being able to perform in front of other people, uh, she enlists the assistance of uh, an ex-champion canine agility course competitor um, who very abruptly retired and uh, um, who now lives as a bit of a hermit in the Blufflands. Her name is Bernadette Box and she lives alone. Um, and uh, she seeks her out and seeks out her counsel. Um, and, uh, you get the sense immediately that uh, Bernadette is a bit lonesome. Uh, she lives uh, 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 quite a Spartan, uh, empty life. And there's something about that illustration of, of Annie and Runt filling up her home and making it feel very cosy um, that I just really adore. It reminds me of one of my favourite Quentin Blake illustrations, actually, um, in Matilda, where uh, Matilda visits Miss Honey. And I don't know if you remember, but Miss Honey's house uh, was kind of bereft of uh, furniture and uh, modern yep. computers. 
Um, but just the fact of Matilda being uh, made that scene really um, warm and really cozy and really lovely. Um, and I think that illustration, uh, the, the two of them dovetail pretty neatly, I think. Yes, absolutely. I love that you. I love a lot of these illustrations. They're beautiful, and I, I imagine this would have also been a very unique experience for you, as uh, having suddenly all of your words suddenly come to life, and you see these images coming through and going, "Wow, these are my characters that that are being committed here." Was it, I imagine you would have had to uh, must a, a, a pinched yourself moment almost, seeing yeah, like, "Wow." Magic. Yeah, it's really mm. magic, um, uh, and uh, it's a really lovely thing to to see them in a, in a new way, in a different way. Um, and, you know, Sarah really brings this story to life. I can't imagine these characters um, uh, differently now, you know. I, I, I really feel as though she's elevated this book and um, she's defined the characters in a, in a really artful and, and beautiful way. Um, I've been really fortunate in my career to um, have some very talented people interpret my characters and, and, and my work, whether it's on the stage or on the screen um, or now through illustration. And um, it's a really beautiful thing. It's really lovely. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah, it, 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 the, just the harmony of it is, is, is another thing that again, adds to that timeless, lovely feel about it. And you can see the influences on the page as well in the story, as well as in the illustrations. Um, I, I'm aware that we have to move on and we do have some fantastic questions, which we'll get to in a second for anyone who has joined, you can uh, feel free to drop any questions in there in the comments uh, below and we'll try and get to as many as we can, but kind of as a last point to finish off usually we always kind of like to say you know what do you want readers to take away from the book and whenever I kind of see that often I like to respond by saying well go read it go find out for yourself <laughs> because whatever you get out of it is uh, is is what you do um so instead I want to ask the question um what did writing this book teach you wow that's a great question what did it teach mm -hmm. me you know I think I think Annie Shearer and Runtz came into my life in a moment where I needed to feel hopeful, where I needed to feel optimistic and uh, where I needed some strength and courage. Um, and I'm enormously grateful to them. You know, Annie is just such a, a beautiful, sensitive, perceptive kid. Her optimism doesn't seek to rewrite reality. She still contends with struggles and concerns and worries. Um, and uh, her determination, her iron will, um, is something that I responded to. And I think the same way that her family draws strength from that, I did as well. Um, but Annie also goes through a bit of a reckoning where um, she comes to understand and appreciate that she doesn't have to take on everything herself and fix every problem uh, independently um, and that some things really are beyond her own tool belt and she needs to enlist um, the, the assistance of, of the people around her who care about her. Um, and I think Annie and I share uh, that same revelation um, and so I think uh, we both had uh, a, a moment of clarity. Uh, and so I would only have learned that uh, by by writing this novel. And so, um, you know, I owe Annie and uh, her family a debt of gratitude, I suppose. I love that. I love that, like, a character taught you something, a character that that you put to the page actually made you look at things in a different way. I think that's fantastic. And uh, just, go again, highlights that not only can uh, can you input influence on a book, a book can do the exact same right back as you, back at you and make you look at things in a new way. Um, that's absolutely awesome. Um, we have a couple of questions. Uh, and uh, for anyone listening again, you can throw questions in right now. Um, so we've got the first one here from Bereka. I'm sorry if I, if I butcher any of the pronunciations uh, of any of the names here. Was Run inspired by particular people in your life? Do you often pull from, from particular people? Well, that's a wonderful question. Um, yes, I mean, uh, well, uh, there are some characters uh, in Runt, certainly, uh, who, uh, who are cobbled together, assembled, I suppose, by uh, some people uh, who have been quite influential in my life. One of whom, I suppose, is Dolly Shearer, who is Annie's grandmother. 
Um, you know, Dolly is a formidable, loyal, civic-minded, uh, adventurous, uh, ferociously protective, tough as an old boot uh, character. I, I really adore her. Um, and, you know, I was raised by a, a line of um, very tough old broads. Um, and Dolly is a, a tribute to, to all of them, you know, from my mother to my grandma, Joyce, who uh, shared Dolly's um, uh, affinity for uh, joining every sport and committee in her country town. Um, you know, Dolly's a member of every sporting club and, you know, she was an ex-boxer. Uh, you know, she's, she's just up for it, you know, um, and that was my grandmother. Also my great auntie doll, um, who, uh, you know, I was a little bit afraid of, to be honest with you, uh, but she was uh, <laughs> ferociously um, just loyal and lovely and, and, and wonderful and cared deeply about her family. Um, so all these, all these women, I suppose, uh, got, stirred into the pot and out came Dolly Shearer. Um, and she's a bit of a tribute to, to them all. Yeah. Oh, I love it. That's fantastic. And you always pulling from, from those people in your life. Are amazing. We've got a question uh, from Hudson Fire. In one of your uh, live discussions, you said, and I think you mentioned it as well this evening, um, that Runt was a story that you kept in the bottom drawer. Were there any, any of your previous books came from the same place? No, the, the the other books that I've written, um, I've I've tended to uh, uh, develop fairly rapidly. You know, you get a, a very clear sense that that um, you've got something with uh, uh, spark and potential, and you want to chase it down uh, as as quickly as you can because you are afraid of losing it. Sometimes um, it's a bit the same as if you're. Uh, writing a song, for example, you want to you want to chase it. You want to you want to capture it because you might lose certain threads. You might you might not have it occur to you again, uh, and so there's a little bit of anxiety that underpins it. You want you want to capture it as as soon as you can. Yes. Um, I think the closest I've come to uh, to the same kind of process was maybe with Honeybee. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I suppose I had a, a few aborted attempts. At, bringing that story to life. The first uh, for, for Honeybee was the fact that I initially wrote it as a one act play, which was a mistake. Um, but I, for some reason, I thought that was the, that was how it wanted to be written. And I was very wrong. Um, and I'm by no means a playwright. Um, I should leave theatre to the thespians. It's where it rightly belongs. Um, and so there was a period of time where, where Honeybee wasn't quite dormant, but I couldn't work out how it wanted to be written. Um, and then a few months later, um, I had Sam's voice um, and she was telling the story uh, through her lens. And I understood implicitly, instinctively, that that was how it wanted to be written. And from there, it unraveled pretty rapidly. So sometimes it's a matter of just finding a way in um, and, mm. uh, and, and getting an access point for a, for a story. Um, but there are a few little ideas that I have in, uh, in that bottom drawer, uh, which I'm, I'm sure uh, over the years I'll, I'll attend to. So it won't be the last uh, book that gets written that way, I don't think. Oh, exciting. I'll, I'll, I'll want to poke you again before the end of it on that, on that particular <laughs> subject of stuff that you've got in the bottom drawer. Um, we have a question around on the subject of, of theatre pieces. Could you see Run being transformed into a theatre piece like Jasper Jones? Oh my goodness! I would love that. Yes, absolutely. I think it would be. I think it would be fantastic. Um, I'm not sure if uh, uh, if dogs can be trained for the theatre, um, but I did see an amazing uh, production uh, a few years back from my good friend John Sheedy, who did Storm Boy, um, mm -hmm. and uh, the pelican was brought to life. Mr. Percival was brought to life uh, via puppetry. And it was just glorious to behold. It was brilliant. So maybe, uh, you know, we could have a similar situation for, for Runt. Um, uh, that would be magic. I would love that. Yeah, absolutely. That, that could be on our, our horizon. Yeah, like there's so many great plays that have been brought to, like animals have been brought to life by puppetry. I think War Horse is one of the big ones that first comes to mind whenever I think of that. Just the nature, it feels completely natural. Like that they nail how that how this the animal interacts and the characters interact. It's it's amazing. We've probably got time for for one more question, um, and uh, it's a one about getting 
uh, runt into schools. So do you think runt can be integrated into teaching and learning um, in schools? And what years do you think it could be implemented and what other things could it be used for? That's a great question. Absolutely. Um, look, over the past few weeks, I've been touring runt across the nation. Um, and uh, some of my favourite memories have been uh, visiting schools and, and talking to younger people about runt. Um, it's such a, an enthusiastic, joyful uh, uh, experience to, to share books with, with younger readers. Um, I've had some amazing feedback from, from younger readers about Runt, as well as teachers. Um, they're reading it in school at the moment already, and kids are running back after lunch for, uh, for, for reading time. Um, so excited about uh, uh, delving into another chapter or two of Runt, which is really wonderful. Um, uh, we have uh, a teacher's resource pack available uh, through the Alan Unwin, Unwin website. Uh, and so it's our intention to uh, provide whatever resources we can for teachers uh, to introduce Runt into the classroom. Um, so far, it's been enormously um, uh, uh, and enthusiastically received. Um, uh, so it's really uh, positive, I think. Um, and I've got to say, I'm really looking forward to book week next year and seeing a lot of Annie Shearers out there with their tool belts and their team Shearer beanies and their, <laughs> and their runs as well. I'm, I, I can't wait. I think that's the highest form of compliment you could get uh, with, with, with your book, seeing that sort of translation with younger people getting behind it and enjoying, that, enjoying it that much. Yes, without a doubt, yeah. Mm. Um, I actually kind of want to ask, I've got a question of my own that's kind of come off the back of it. It's been, it's so cool to see that you've been touring it and going around to schools. Has, has, there, has there been a reaction that's actually like kind of left you awestruck or surprised you like out of the blue? Oh, look, I mean, it's, yeah, I, the, the, the kids who have fallen in love with this book um, uh, are just so lovely and so giving and so kind, you know, I think, um, you know, uh, sometimes we lose sight of how sophisticated uh, uh, younger readers are um, and the simple fact that they demand the same ingredients of uh, a good book that, that anyone else does, you know. Um, and so their interpretations, um, what they give to a book uh, is just as profound as, as anybody else. And so I'm really delighted in sharing a book uh, with kids. Um, I think my favourite part, has been uh, just making them laugh. It's, it's been a really wonderful thing. Um, uh, part of the presentation is I show them uh, what uh, a, a canine agility course uh, championship looks like when it goes right. Uh, but we also have a look at what happens when it goes spectacularly wrong as well. Um, so that's been, a, that's been a great joy to, to share with them. Oh, I love it. I also love, I just got, saw a message there from Sarah is pondering, uh, saying costume challenge for next year yes. to, to dress up like Annie. Yes, please. Uh, I can't wait to see that. I could honestly talk uh, to you all evening. I know I could, but I know that you are incredibly busy um, and you are obviously still doing a lot of stuff with this book. So I'll finish up by kind of saying, uh, what's what's next? What's up next uh, for Craig Silby after uh, you've finished touring Runt? Well, I'll be touring Runt uh, throughout next year and, and potentially beyond. Um, but uh, at the beginning of next year, we'll uh, continue with the development of the Honeybee adaptation. Um, it's our, I've sold the option to a fantastic producer. It's our intention to uh, adapt it uh, as a six-part series. Uh, and so we're just assembling our writer's room at the moment and looking for partnerships. And so that'll be next. Um, Beyond that, uh, we're uh, very, very hopeful that uh, Runt will be adapted for screen as well. And so that may be happening uh, quite rapidly. Uh, and beyond that, uh, my next novel uh, appears as though it will be a Western that is set in Western Australia in the gold fields uh, at the turn of the 20th century. Um, I'm really excited about that. And so if I can spend a little bit of time next year, I'll, I'll start work on that. Oh my God! So much yeah. going on. I have, I have, I feel like I have so many questions, and I've run, and I, and I know that we've run out of time. I'm that diving into historical fiction would be absolutely amazing. But those those adaptations sound absolutely 
Incredible. Uh, I mean, for, for anyone who has read Honeybee, first of all, go and do it. Just that is, I am waiting with utter bated breath for that for for that adaptation. That sounds absolutely exciting. Wow, you are busy. You are busy. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um. Again, I could talk to you all day. Unfortunately, we have uh, run out of time. So I'll f finish off by simply saying thank you for taking time out of your out of your day to to chat to us live over over Instagram. And it has been an absolute pleasure, Craig. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, Nick, the honor's all mine, mate. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And let's do it again sometime. Absolutely, we'll do it. Hopefully, we can do it again with the uh, with the next book. Uh, that comes out, and I'll be even more excited to suddenly see uh, to sit to, to be sitting down to to reading a western from Craig Sylvie. Um, to everyone who's uh, watching this evening, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure answering your questions, um, and it's been great chatting to uh, to Craig, of course, about his brand new book Runt, which you can get a copy of. Be sure to tag your friends and family in the comments. Link them uh, down below in the description. I will include a link to the book. Uh, runt in the um, in our bio so you can order a copy of it for yourself from booktopia.com.au if you enjoyed the discussion you could order a copy of it um, and again thank you so much uh, for everyone watching today thank you so much guys have a great night